Yes, you've taken over the business of HSBC yeah. up in Canada. Let's start there. Tell me how that's going and why you seem to think you're operating from a position of strength and maybe even on the front foot in 24. So our, our, our currency is very strong. We're incredibly excited about HSBC Canada. We received approval for it, regulatory approval, in December. We just announced that we're going to close the transaction at the end of March. It's a close and convert, so we can convert the entire client organization onto the RBC platform at the end of March. So we're very excited about that, and it continues the growth story for RBC. We have one of the strongest uh, valuations of any bank in the world on a price-to-book ratio. We're one of the largest banks in the world from a market cap. So that strength, that capital strength, allowed us to take advantage of HSBC's decision to leave Canada. Their seventh largest bank, you know, roughly $80 billion in assets, 750,000 clients are all migrate over to RBC. But what they do really well is they're a fantastic global, internationally connected bank, cross-border bank, multi-currency accounts, trade finance capability, global view. And all that capability comes over to RBC where we weren't as strong. And not only do we bring the clients over with that capability, we get to offer that trade finance, that global view capability to 15 million of our existing clients. Second thing it does for us is we take that franchise, we put it onto our tech stack, the RBC tech stack, and we are able to offer all the investments we've made in whether it's online banking, mobile banking, trade finance, uh, treasury management, cash management, the HSBC clients will have access to a broader suite of product, a broader suite of capability, more channels to access. So from a client perspective, from an employee perspective, it's a big win. And from a shareholder perspective, it's incredibly accretive to RBC. We're a 14.5% CT1 ratio now. It's going to be roughly 240 basis points of capital. It's incredibly accretive to the organization. Boosts our ROE, which is around 16%, significantly well into our, our target range. So it's accretive for the shareholder. It's good for clients. It's good for Canada. We'll pay more taxes in Canada. We'll pay more dividends to shareholders. And therefore, like, we're, we're really excited about the growth story that uh, this presents for RBC. The two things you said there, Dave, that you repeated, actually. Trade finance, global view. Yeah. Here we are in Davos, Switzerland. How challenged is trade and taking a global view at the moment? Trade will always exist. It's whether it's a regional view of trade, uh, a lot of geopolitical commentary about uh, supply routes, transit routes being challenged, obviously. And we'll figure that out over time as we think about our, our trade partners long term and we build rebuild and rethink trading blocks, trade will exist. And it may look different today and have some components of the world today and some components of the world tomorrow, but it's always going to exist. We have to, as a society, take advantage of our relative differences and our relative advantage. We have to keep inflation out of our economies and, and global trade and global access to trade has allowed us to operate our, our economies much more efficiently. So we'll find a way. It just feels a little cloudy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. I am curious, <laughs> as you talk about HSBC and this idea of, yeah. uh, of integrating the yeah. Canada business, yeah. what's next? Who else are you going to acquire? Well, we just acquired Bruin Dolphin in the UK 18 months ago. We're the third largest uh, wealth manager in the UK. We're the sixth largest wealth manager in uh, the United States. And we're the number one wealth manager both on distribution and asset management in Canada. So we're building, most people don't know, we're building this fantastic global wealth franchise. So when we think about acquisition and M&A, very much our global wealth franchise is part of that, whether it's in the United States or in Europe, we're thinking, how do we roll up more capabilities? Very fragmented in uh, the UK, as you know. Uh, so there's opportunities there. So building out that global wealth distribution franchise predominantly uh, is important to us over time. We'll generate significant excess capital, even more so with the HSBC acquisition, rebuilding our capability to do a cash transaction with our capital. So wealth management that uh, is a major focus for us. What's interesting to me that you said was that it was not investment banking, that you are interested in further wealth management acquisition targets, but a lot of people are wondering what's going to happen to all these regional banks, and there mm -hmm. needs to be some sort of roll-up, and you're not involved in any of that. That's what it sounds like. Why? Are you concerned about some of these banks? We have a fantastic regional uh, U.S. bank and city national bank in California. It's a $75 billion bank by deposits. Uh, it's been a challenging year for regional banks, including city national, with deposit betas changing, with costs increasing from a profitability perspective. We missed our targets. Uh, we're rebuilding those, that performance over the coming year, and I expect us to reach our, our proper run rate by the end of the year, early into next year. But the regulatory environment's really uncertain in the U.S. The rules around liquidity, the rules around capital, the Basel III 
end game. It's probably been a topic on this show all week. Uh, when those rules are resolved, and all we're looking for is a level playing field, Canada's already moved more aggressively to a Basel III end game. So we're looking, are we pulling up to where we are? Are we coming down to where other global players and other, other global economies? So that certainty is really important when you value an organization and understand the deposit flows and where they're going. The deposit story in the United States is still challenged as well. So I think I, I would need more clarity on those outcomes before I could really value a U.S. franchise right now. So are you interested in expanding in the U.S. at all right now, or is it not really the most fruitful place? Is it other places in wealth management that are more fragmented that you see a greater opportunity? We have significant opportunities to grow in the U.S. on an organic basis, whether it's our ninth large, the ninth largest uh, capital markets business in the United States. We're seeing greater ECM activity, DCM activity. The rate environment is becoming more constructive for that business. So growing our capital markets operation by bringing in teams, expanding our sector coverage. We're doing well there. We're hiring teams and lifting out teams in the U.S. wealth franchise. We have 550 billion of AUA. We're the, so the sixth largest franchise, national franchise in, in every market. So again, organic growth. We brought in $25 billion in AUA last year alone, through largely through team lift outs and new clients coming in and growing the city national franchise at the same time, which is a, a real focus on the entertainment business in California, uh, selectively growing that business. So we see significant opportunity across those three franchises. We have $4 billion in revenue in capital markets and a billion in profit. We have a $500 million P&L in our wealth franchise, and we have another opportunity to do something similar in, in City National. So growing those franchises is really uh, our core focus right now. But once we digest HSBC and we rebuild that capital base, then we'll... we'll You'll come first and tell us. We'll come first to tell you, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Dave, I want to finish on housing. I yeah. have to say, yeah. I'll speak for Lisa and me. Yeah. When rates went from zero to five, when yeah. we saw rate hiking cycles in places like Canada, the UK, and even Australia, yeah. we were both thinking about what on earth is going to happen to housing markets? Right. Where does that leave the banks? I was thinking about that with regards to Canada as well. What is happening? So there has been a, a payment shock to Canadians. And, the difference between Canada and the U.S. is we don't have a 30-year fixed mortgage. We usually have four or five-year terms. So we have a lot of variable rate mortgages at the same time. 20% of our book roughly is variable rate mortgage. So you've seen a payment shock to about 30% of Canadians right now in the tune of 20 to 25% increase a month, four or $500 a month increase. So that's been challenging for Canadians. What it does is it slows the economy much more quickly. Unlike the U.S. where there is no payment shock really unless you break your mortgage or sell your house. So the U.S. economy struggled to slow the consumer. The Canadian economy has slowed the consumer quite significantly, and we've seen that in the credit card business. People have a mortgage. People have a variable rate mortgage. Credit card spend is off. Canadians are handling that payment shock well, so you're not seeing that migrate to default, but you're seeing the Canadian economy slow much more quickly to the point that we already have a quarter of negative GDP under our belt. We're looking at probably another negative quarter of GDP. We'll technically be in a soft landing recession uh, early this year. So Canada's slowing more quickly. Inflation's still a little bit sticky, around just above 3%, but there's still 70% of that book is going to reprice over the next two to three years, and 15% you know, this year, 25% next year. So there's, unless we get rates down, there's more payment shock coming, but consumers are handling it. 